Today we're going to be talking about ventilation, east coast versus west coast and tricks of the trade. First off, why do we ventilate? Uh, we ventilate to heat, uh, alleviate heated air and gases from a structure to help with our fire suppression and rescue operations. Now what are our considerations when ventilating? Um, is there a need for ventilation? What type of, uh, what building type do we have? What type of construction? What's our roof type and construction? What's our fire load? And do we have the resources and equipment to accomplish the job? So I know a lot of you are from the volunteer ranks and you may not have a training facility as nice as this uh, to work a train on, uh, but these props here that you see, these ventilation props can be uh, created uh, very easily and very cheaply. You can contact your local vocational schools, you can um, contact your prison work crews, uh, you can also request donations from your lumberyard. Just remember, efficiency is a direct product of training and training is what's going to save your life. Predominantly, there's always been a difference between the East Coast and West Coast operations on the, when it comes to ventilation. East Coast likes to take uh, rotary saw for their ventilation uh, techniques, and then West Coast likes to take uh, chainsaws to the roof for uh, ventilation techniques. Uh, it's not due to one, one or the other being more manly or, or due to ego, but generally just because of different types of construction. When it comes to residential ventilation, both coasts tend to do some type of louver and loo operation. Uh, Although East Coast will take the rotary saw and East, uh, West Coast will take the chainsaw, it always stems from a different in styles and construction of our roofs. East Coast will usually have a 12 foot on center for their rafters and West Coast will have a 20 foot inch uh, on center rafters. Not only with understanding our roof construction, you need to understand our building construction with that. Uh, understanding what, especially on a residential, there could be a the attic space built over where you have knee walls. Ventilating at the top was not gonna help you uh, you may have those knee walls that have those vacant spaces, so you may have to lower your ventilation holes. Now going back on the on-center and our different roof constructions, with that, it, for the uh, East Coast operation, it's going to take five cuts versus on the West Coast operation, it's going to take four cuts. And that's to get to our minimum spacing of a four, uh, four by four hole to alleviate heated air and gases. Now generally a four by four hole is not, is adequate, but how big do we make our hole? Large enough to get adequate ventilation through. And what tells us that? The crew's inside. Now, when it comes to commercial ventilation, East Coast generally has a little tougher time with it. They have, uh, not in tougher as in their skill level, just in their roofing material. Uh, tighter uh, truss placement, thicker roof material. And that's generally why they take those circ saws up and start doing their 798 or coffin cut. If you're not familiar with uh, 798 or coffin cut, it's detailed in the PowerPoint presentation. For you West Coast uh, firefighters, being familiar with the 798 cut may help you if you come across construction of similar fashion to your East Coast counterparts. Although you may not see it in your uh, newer construction, a big tip off to, for this type of construction will be in your older construction, back in the day when the wood was plentiful. For West Coast commercial ventilation, we typically do some type of uh, louver and loose system. There's also some other techniques out there, like di such as dicings and uh, others as well. Uh, with the louver and loo system, we're going to usually do it with uh, two sawyers marrying each other and at least one hook. For West Coast louver and loo, when it comes to panelized roofs, we generally have a wider span for our trusses. Uh, with our sawyers marrying each other, we're able to make that whole span and uh, create one giant louver. Uh, we'll start our first louver, our cut, plunging our cuts, the same sawyer on the opposite end, marrying what I'm doing, make a cut down, and then I'm going to start my cut going down our cut. Then I'll finish this cut as the second sawyer on the opposite side is doing, marrying me exactly on the other side. Therefore, we'll have one giant louver. As with any roof operation, we want to remember to cross our cuts, making sure that the uh, cut is complete. Therefore, allowing us to louver the uh, uh, opening and to open it up for our heated air and gases to escape. Although this technique is predominantly West Coast, uh, for your East Coast guys, this is feasible. Uh, you just have to understand your, your tools. And with the circ saw, you may not have as much reach as I do with, a, say, a chainsaw with a 20-inch bar. So I may have to lean out a little bit more and get creative with my hand placement and do the cuts and then travel down. This louver and loo operation is detailed in our PowerPoint presentation. In, in with this, You'll show it with uh, several other cuts, such as the hallway, or our firefighter access cuts and our uh, defensive strips. These cuts will come in later operations as uh, the fire progresses or as command calls for it, or as your interior crews call for it. 
The firefighter access holes are to alleviate the hallways of uh, heated air and gases to allow for both uh, movement of our firefighters to the uh, fire room or fire apartment, as well as to allow an egress point for any uh, um, victims. Our defensive trips are, uh, the strips are designed to you know, make our last stand and cutoff point for the fire. So the best thing for you to do is, is go out into your first response areas, find out what's out there, uh, what, what you have um, in your first due areas, whether you do have these center hallway um, apartments or you do have garden style apartments. Uh, therefore, you're pre-planning your operations and so when it comes down to um, completing your operation, you have a better understanding and, and already have a game plan in place. So we're gonna be going over some tricks of the trade um, in this next portion. Uh, one of the things you always want to do is keep your saw running at uh, full RPMs as you do the cut. Second of all is trust your cut. Um, don't always feel that you always have to look at the blade making cutting material because that will generally cause your saw to drift and your line won't be straight. Uh, one of the techniques that I'm going to go over here shortly is uh, with the rotary saw is instead of having my hand on the bar itself, I'm going to rest my hand a little bit back further and it'll allow the blade to bounce over the raptors a lot easier and just roll right over them without me worrying so much as they're going to cut the material itself. Because ultimately that's our goal. Cut the roofing material and not the trusses because the trusses are what, our, what we're walking on and what's our safety components. So becoming comfortable with the saw, for instance, uh, a lot has to do with your hand placement and uh, tr your trust of your abilities. Um, generally, we want to have our hands right here um, one on the handle, one on the uh, trigger. You know, this is generally what we always t teach. Now, when we're cutting, in order to keep that straight line, if we place our hand back here and just walk back, now I can keep that straight line, and I have one center of point. And sit. When I'm grabbing up here, I tend to like want to drift over and look at the cut, and that, what, by doing that, I'm rocking the saw and therefore causing my line to drift. So we could, what we saw with, uh, in the operation I just did is with my hand placement allowing the uh, saw to run directly over the rafters. Um, instead of keeping the pressure down on the blade and forcing the blade through the material, I'm allowing the uh, saw blade to just rock over the rafters. That may help you in, in your operations with the circular saw and your roof cuts. So if you're new to saw work in general, um, just understanding that these are powerful machines and you really it needs you need to be cognizant of um, filling the material through the saw um, and not cutting through your structural members because ultimately you want to be operating in a safe manner and uh, not putting yourself or any of your team in harm's way. So the best way to get comfortable with your saw and understanding uh, what, what your saw's capabilities are, um, the, uh, the equipment that you have on the rig is getting out there and practicing and training on it. Uh, you want to, whether it's on your roof props that you have or grabbing some uh, pallets and throwing some OSB on top of it and just doing um, straight cuts, just to understand that feel of what the saw is doing through the material and when it hits a structural member. Because that, that's, that's kind of the key. You want to be operating in a safe manner um, for both you and your uh, team. You really want to put emphasis on your training. Uh, you want to be proficient in your saw work and comfortable with what you're doing. Um, before the first time you're called out to do it on, on an actual operation. Because it's not only yourself that you've you got to be careful about. Um, there's also your fellow firefighters inside the structure uh, during their fire suppression operations, as well as any victims. Because that's ultimately what we're here for, is to save and protect lives. So this next portion, we'll be talking about uh, residential roof cutting um, and uh, foot placement and uh, operating the saw safely on, on the roof. Uh, some things that I've learned, uh, traditionally what we always use as a foothold is either a halligan or an axe. Um, those are great and all, but what that does is it gives you a single point of uh, contact with the roof. And it's only one foot, one position for your, uh, to make your foot stable. Uh, what I'm going to show you is use of a, a six foot rubbish hook. Um, for your West Coast guys, because traditionally we, you, that's what you'll see out in the West Coast is we'll have these trash hooks. And for you uh, East Coast guys, use of the uh, New York hook in conjunction with uh, a roofer on your lot, um, on your roof. So, you know, 
this is great and all for like a standard 812 pitch uh but with this it limits me on on my stability it's just i only have my foot on that point so i'm limited on, on my movement and where i can go um and with use uh, as i'll show you in a little bit um with the use of the trash hook that'll give me the full range of sliding my feet across to make my cuts uh, and i'll have that back and stability on the roof uh where it really becomes prevalent is when we're cutting on a 12 12 pitch um that it's it's a lot steeper uh footing is at, at, at its minimum so uh these this is one trick that's been uh, very helpful in um and it was developed by uh, uh dave madsen from seattle fire first started showing this and we uh, picked it up at Firetown Training Specialists. So generally when we go on any roof, we're, we're, of course we're going to sound, place our roof ladder, should have a roof ladder in place uh, whether the roof is stable or unstable uh, just for safety uh, considerations and that way we have a, a way out. Once we make our way up, go onto the roof. Now I'm going to take the trash hook and with the two tines I'm going to take the closest tying towards the roof and I'm going to bury it. What that does is it gives me a stable platform to, to uh, operate from. So once this is buried in, um, the person with the hook should be the second person up. First man up on the ladder will be their Sawyer with this chainsaw. With this position, I'll have this here and basically what I'm doing is I'm creating a stable platform for that Sawyer to make the cuts. And the great thing with this, uh, it also gives me the ability to move up and down uh, to give the, uh, make the hole larger if I need to. And what that is, just working in conjunction with your Sawyer, um, he just steps over, takes the weight off the tool, and then you just slide it up. If I can get... Move it up so he can cut up higher. Move it down so he can cut lower. So now as a Sawyer, I could be using this whole ridge to walk across now, having that stability with that backing on my foot. This gives me a steady, steady pl uh, platform to make my cuts. So if, where it really becomes predominant is our 12-12 pitch. Uh, we're generally cutting in a more vertical cut versus a uh, lengthwise of the roof structure. So what I do, he could start very high on the, on the hook, so allowing me, if he raised that up, and this is my starting point, once I've started that cut, I can, once I started that cut and completed that portion, I step out, he lowers it, and I step back in, and now I can finish to a bigger hole. Uh, so for you East Coast guys uh, who generally don't carry uh, rubbish hooks uh, on their rigs, this could also be uh, completed with a New York hook, six foot hook, and maybe bearing a halogen or axe. Uh, the halogen or axe will be your focal point um, at, at the one end, and then your uh, second firefighter will be at the uh, roofer moving up and down. So for the East Coast guys, this is a basic, basic setup. Uh, bearing your axe or halogen at one end, hooking it with your hook, and then placing your uh, end of your um, New York hook on, on the roof or allowing it to be a fulcrum point for you. So on cutting residential roofs um, with the chainsaw, IFSTA, uh, a, lot of, a lot of these uh, companies have set pa uh, patterns that they like to cut. Um, cut, you know, your top cut, farthest cut, lower cut, and then you're close to your ladder. Um, it's all up to you um, and what your SOPs for your department are. Um, I generally like to work in a, in a box. I don't like to waste movement. I don't like to cross over where I'm cutting uh, just because it's a preference for me and uh, I feel that I'm not wasting movement of uh, going back and forth over the cuts. Um, I'm going to show you that way. Um, one of the key things for doing uh, where you're cutting on a roof, always keep your uh, saw at full RPMs while you're running. Uh, once you plunge in the material, you don't have to bury it all the way. Just get enough to get through that roof material. Push the saw through your material. That'll allow you to feel that structural member. Once the saw bunts up on it, you'll kind of feel that. The saw may bog down depending on how, what your power head is of the saw. Um, roll over that rafter, continue with your cuts. Once you finish, make sure all your cuts are um, cut completely, and then go ahead and louver away. So, and just remember that just like anything that we have on our rigs, uh, this is a piece of hardware and it has a lot of moving parts. You may be on the roof and it may uh, crap out on you. But remember, you always have one tool that never runs out of fuel. 
uh, that'll get you through any roof. So never forget what you have this. You should always take this up on the roof with you, uh, whether it's on your hip, buried into the, uh, into the roof itself, but this thing never runs out of fuel. So I did a basic uh, 4x4 cut. I, I went in a circular mo uh, motion. I like to do that because um, it doesn't allows me not to uh, waste any movement. Um, as you noticed, I, I switched hands. Don't feel that you don't have to or you can't switch hands. Uh, that just allows for more efficiency in your work um, and also gives you better positioning, body positioning in your cuts. Makes you more for a stable platform. Um, and always uh, finish your last cut towards your ladder or on your ladder uh, is how I like to do it. And that way if, the, if we have active fire working below us and as soon as I pop that roof, um, I'm safely on my uh, ladder uh, working my way down off the roof um, once the operation's over. Uh, other keynotes, uh, always make sure you have a ladder um, on your roof, roof or ladder for uh, safety reasons. Second means of egress, uh, not only for your first ladder coming onto the roof, but uh, a second ladder in position somewhere on the roof line, uh, just in case, the, as we say, the world turns brown and we have to hay, make a heyday for the, the ladders. If you generally got two guys up here and there's one ladder, somebody's gonna be making a jump and we, all, we don't wanna be doing that. Uh, try not to go too fast in your operations, uh, therefore cutting out some of your safety features, um, like the roofer to the roof. Uh, I know sometimes in our heydays, we'll, we wanna be fast at, uh, at cutting that hole. Um, and we'll leave the roofer on the, uh, either on the ground or butt it up against the 24 up on the roof line. Um, just remember, uh, slow is smooth, smooth is fast in our operations. And ultimately we wanna be doing this uh, safely. Everybody needs to go home. Some things I like to look for in a saw when uh, considering it for fire ground operations, I like to take a look at the handle. Um, I, I like this handle uh, opposed to the straight handle. It allows me for a better positioning if I need to change my hands in different locations. Uh, allowing for a more comfortable cut. Um, we generally like a 20-inch bar out here. Um, I've seen departments with 16-inch bars, that's fine. It's what your SOPs at your department and what you guys generally use. Um, the air filter is also another big component. Uh, this one here has a dual-stage dual air filter, um, allowing it to cut through uh, smoky environments, uh, which is basically what we're generally doing in fire ground operations. Um, and then the chain, you want a, a solid chain. Uh, this one is here is a saber tooth. Um, it's pretty much your granddaddy of them all. Um, cuts not only through your standard OSB asphalt sheeting, it'll cut through your metal decking roofs, your uh, concrete shingles, concrete siding. It's uh, your stage two wood spike. Uh, and another thing to consider, uh, some of your departments may, you guys may like uh, using the, the depth gauge. Um, which is fine. Um, it is a unique tool. It's a great tool. Um, but re remember that this is just a tool. You don't want to rely on this to make your cut um, for where, whether you're doing the two, to go too deep into the roof material. That should be, uh, you should be, have a better understanding of that, what the saw is capable do, of doing and what you're doing while you're making your cut and not solely relying on the depth gauge. Uh, so some of the key features on this, uh, this is adaptable 14 inch to 16 inch blade. Uh, which is nice. Uh, it gives me that, that extra width on the blade will give me more material to cut through. Um, I can put uh, whatever style of blade I want on it, whether it's just a multi-purpose blade, concrete cutting steel, um, use our spec, spec ops blade, um, which is nice. It has the water feature, of course. Uh, your department may not need those. Um, I've seen departments uh, take those off and, um, because not, they don't plan on doing any concrete um, cutting. Uh, the other great feature on this is, again, the handle, just like their chainsaw. It's uh, a little bit more ergonomically uh, fitting to allow for me to change my position uh, a little bit more fluid. I have a little bit more um, hand placement areas for me to uh, place my hands, which is very, a very nice feature. 
So uh, with that, I mean, your department may not have the funds or budget for this, but the best key thing is to recognize what you have, understand what you have, and know its limitations, and then work safely.